Hello, welcome back to Intelligent Design. I'm your host, Dan Felder, and today we're going to be playing the infamous, the almighty, the one that started it all, Legend of Zelda. This is one of the finest early adventure games ever made. Um, I played this a year ago for the first time ever, and it still holds up. I mean, oh my god, does it still hold up. This game is phenomenally good. Um, all right, well, we're going to dig right into it. So first thing I want to say is we are not going into the whole game. I'm just going to let the title screen play, by the way. Um, we are not digging into the whole game. Um, Castlevania is incredibly well designed. It's tight and it's short enough that I could do the entire series in just six parts. But as a listener suggested, um, even with other short games, trying just some shorter series is probably a better idea to help people get involved. Because uh, otherwise, if you have to go through an entire six-part series um, every t time the new thing comes out, it's just harder to get in. So I'm going to be trying to make this one video on the opening of Legend of Zelda, which frankly, for an open-world game like this, is sort of the point. Um, that's all you really need. So basically, I'm going to talk about this, that Legend of Zelda is an open-world game. I'm, gonna be, I'm just typing... <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm just going to be typing in my name here. So going in... Um, it's an open-world game, and that's important because open-world games are very different than something like Castlevania, which has incredibly tight level design. I mean, as Castlevania evolved, it would become much more open-world. Um, open-worlds basically need to give you a very solid initial experience. A very solid initial experience, because the player needs to feel comfortable. They need to feel like they understand what's going on. They have to feel like they understand, um, they, have, they have freedom to explore and not be freaked out by what's going on. All this stuff's good. Then they also have to give you very good core mechanics, stuff that's fun to do, a lot of. A uh, good combat system is often important. Just whatever the open world exploration is, if it's just jumping around and platforming, even like something like Untitled Story, these need to give you really good initial combat mechanics and good core mechanics, and then just give you a lot of variety. Once you have a good initial experience, the players feel that they understand what's going on and what to do, and what they can choose to do, that's even more important. You give a lot of players an open world and they just don't know where to go or what to do. They don't. You have to let them understand that it really is up to them. Um, and then you give them a really good core mechanic experience, something they can do a lot of and enjoy a lot of. After that, mostly you just need a lot of extra content. So we are going to dive into the initial experience starting now. This is our title screen. Um, I'm going to be really digging into this a lot. <laughs> um, and last time, somebody mentioned in one of the comments that level designers often don't think through all the things in the detail that I'm talking about in this series. Um, sometimes we just throw stuff in that feels right without thinking too much about it. And maybe and just tweak it if there's a problem. Um, that's absolutely true. I've done this a lot myself. But I want to make it clear that I'm not trying to read, like, insanely into what the original designers were thinking of. Um... Basically, I don't know what the original designers intended, but that's not important. Even if the game was made by a random number generator, it does not matter. It just doesn't matter. We can still look at the game and ask two questions. First, what type of effect is this design having on the player experience? And second, how is it doing that? Again, what type of effect is this design, the environment, the mechanics, every pixel of the screen that happens to be important, what is this having on the effect of the player experience, and how is it doing that? Whenever I'm delving into these designs, like pixel by pixel, and oh my god, do I go deep, um, this is what I'm looking for. It might not, I might be talking about the designers, like placing these objects here for a reason, but that's just like a conversational thing. I don't know what they were thinking, I do not read their minds, I'm just talking about what's happening in the player experience and why. Okay, so let's start over analyzing this opening screen. So this is much more organic than most screens in the NES era. Look, we have these hard lines over here. I'm going to start using the cursor. We've got these hard lines over here and hard lines over here, hard corners. But this is a sort of rolling slope. And we've got a soft corner over here and over here and a little bit over here, but much harder over here. Why, is they do why are they doing this? This is harder to do than just throwing up a bunch of you know grids that a lot of these earlier games did, like Gauntlet and all sorts of stuff. And stuff you spend a lot of time running around. This feels more organic and more natural. It feels more like a natural place rather than something that was built by man. And that's important to this overworld feel. Later, later you're going to see a very different type of design when we go into the dungeons. Also, this is the opening screen. They put some thought into this, I'm sure. But does, again, doesn't really matter. So let's talk about this. In an open world game, they're going to give us lots of different routes. You can go up, you can go down, you can go left, you can go right. Well, you can't go down. wonder why that is. Well, I'll talk about that in a second. 
But first, you need to make these choices feel diff similar. And uh, I'm sorry, you need to make these choices feel different from each other. They can be too similar if you're not careful. If this was a straight cross, if this was just up, down, left, right, featureless uh, cross that we're in, um, all these corners look the same, all these paths look the same, that would be really bad design because left, right, up, down, the choice is arbitrary. We don't know where we're trying to go. We don't know what we're trying to do. These choices don't look different from each other. Something I talk about when I'm um, teaching dungeon masters how to do stuff is that you need the player's choices to feel different from one another. Don't just give them a corridor and a choice in a dungeon of going left or going right. Don't do that. Um, give them an idea of what these two choices are different. Have them say the one the tunnel to the left is glowing with a red light. The tunnel to the right has like moss on the walls. Just that alone gives players a something to go off of. So here we've got the slanting curve, um, and to the left over here a narrow path, a very much more straighter, blockier section with a with a narrow path, and a much fatter section up here. These paths all feel a little different. And where is our eye being called in attention? It's this diagonal. Uh, that diagonal is really important. Um, this channels our eyes up to this point over here. Um, our eyes tend to track diagonals a lot more than straight lines. Magicians use sweeping motions to draw our attention away from things they don't want us to see. They'll go like whoosh with their hand, um, while their hand that's actually doing the important thing is just going very simple straight line. Uh, for photographers take pictures at angles to create a sense of dynamism and depth. That's absolutely true. Now, diagonals just call attention. They have more movement to them than a straight line like this does. This is more boring. This is more interesting. And look at these added rounded features to make it even more so. Um, basically, this calls our attention to this weird black square, which just in the pure design of this black squarishness stands out. This is interesting. But we're going to ignore it for now. <laughs> All right. So we can't go down. This feels like a foundation, which is also nice. If you were given four directions from the top, with right from the beginning, with nothing to go off of, that might be a little overwhelming. Uh, three choices is often the right amount, because you can choose... Um, it's basically a good number of choices that play, people can think about. They can compare the choices very easily to keep them in head at once. It's a very comfortable number of choices, and it feels better than simply binary left or right. It feels like we have more depth and more control, but just enough to give us that sense without overwhelming us at all. And this game, you'll see clearly these choices start getting crazy. So let's go, let's go left. Okay, so look at right here. We've got these things moving around, and they're enemies. You can kind of see that. They've got the angry eyes. they got that stuff. But they're not very aggressive. We have time, a lot of time. Look at this, just to observe how they move. They're like, you know, ferocious animals in the wild, but, you know, we're not in too much danger. We have time to examine what's going on, but we are in some danger, so let's see what happens if we get too close to one. Okay, look, we're, bl we're blasted back, we flash. There's a real sense of knockback. Watch, boom, yep, right there again, boom. And our hearts, as you can see, are going down. And this says life, capital letters, and hearts. This is not courage, this is good symbol design, unlike Castlevania. Um, this is actually, you know, hearts, they make sense that we're losing life. And it says, reinforces that with life right there. We've got almost no direction, we've got no real tutorial, we need to be able to communicate that very simply. It also calls our attention to the top of the screen. We should look at this a bit more later. But you can see these guys are driving us back. All right, um, actually I'm gonna, let my, I'm gonna let them kill me to show you what happens. All right, bam. If you die at all these opening sections, where do you go? Yes, yes. Right back here. And look, I'm being angled up. It's weird to start you. You would think that, hey, we start with the player, with the avatar facing the player. But in every situation, when you start the game to right now, I believe, you're always facing up. You're always facing up. This gives you a sense of direction. This is the simplest way to start the thing. That's how Pokemon works. They like point you, the guy, at the camera very often so that you can see his whole feature. Why would you stick him on the back? That makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense. Unless they're trying to hint that we should go this way. We've got a slanted diagonal up. We've got a big fat area over here. And if we go to the left enough, we would see it was a dead end. We can't go to the left any further right now. It still feels like a choice right now because those enemies killed us, so we don't know. We can keep exploring there if we want, but it's a dead end, so we're not going to waste our time. So what about to the right? Again, you have these very forgiving opening sections. Look, we see the enemies on the very far side of the screen. We have a lot of time to look how it's going on. And uh, now they're shooting stuff at us. Now they're shooting stuff at us. They're, they're not very aggressive. You get to observe them. Um, you don't want to punish people in your open world game instantly for just checking down a new path to see what it has. I've got lots of time to go back and escape. Lots of time. 
and I've got lots of time to look and study these enemies and see how they act in a rather safe environment. Um, so, you don't in an open world section, you want players to feel safe to explore. This is why Untitled Story, if you've seen my um, design video on that, is so great. The very first thing they do is they put you in a nest and they have you jump out and not punish you for falling. So you jump into the unknown and you fall really far, but you're not punished. You don't even take any damage. You don't take damage from falling in that game. It really tells you right away it's safe to go exploring. It's safe to explore the unknown, which is super important in these open world games. So they're shooting stuff. That doesn't look good. Um, it's really easy to avoid them because of this grid pattern. Really easy. So what, what happens is when you're fighting these guys, you start trying to dodge, right? And so you try to run away from the battle. Oh, I take damage. You try to run away from their stuff. Here's what you wouldn't do. Stand still, right? Come on. Let's do this. Come on. Oh, God damn it. I'm trying to line this up. All right, come on. This guy's... Come, just stand still. I'm trying to show... There we go. So you see, if you're looking straight at the projectile, it bounces off your shield. If you're looking straight at the projectile, it bounces off your shield. Boom. There we go. And these grid patterns are actually pretty line, well lined up to make that happen pr sooner rather than later. But it's something you wouldn't expect, right? Like, the last thing you want to do when these things are firing at you is stand still and look straight at them. You wouldn't walk towards the projectile. You would run away from the projectile. But we have this shield. So what's interesting is, when you first see these guys, you're running around and you're running away, but then eventually you notice that one of them bounces off your shield. So when you think that they're that these guys are just too dangerous and that you just need to avoid their attacks, suddenly you realize you've got a new tactic. And what was originally kind of a boring but simple and easy to understand way of engaging them, which is dodge the shots, becomes a more interesting and more deep way to engage them. And because the game does not require you to deal with these guys very in-depth, because it doesn't require you to beat them or destroy them, you can run around them, and you, even if you just start fighting them later, which we'll get to in a second, you don't need um, to use your shield to beat them. Um, so it allows you to get to just sort of eventually, at your own pace, discover this added tactic. And when you do, it makes the encounter feel fresh and interesting again. If they forced you to learn the tactic right at the beginning, the encounter would feel kind of interesting, but it wouldn't get this this boost of getting interesting again as you learn how you had this tactic you already you always had available to you. So it starts kind of boring. Well, it starts cause, that's not true. It starts kind of interesting. Just you know, dodge the, the shots. Then you think, oh, that's cool. Um, I can block the shots, and we'll get to why that's important later. But the point is, I want to talk about here is that it creates an interest curve. It makes it makes you look at all these fights you've had before in a new light, and you feel like you've discovered something new. This game is all about discovery. All right, um, I'm just gonna kill myself to refill my hearts, <laughs> uh, which will take one hit, not problem. Bam. That's always weird that that's like a way to heal up and often is efficient. Um, I don't like that. But we're going to get back into the game, and I forgive it for again being a very early game. So. Um, I'm not going to go up to the top right now, because we're not going to waste any more time. We're going to go straight in here and get our sword. So we've been running around. Maybe we were called immediately into this cave by the diagonal. A lot of people go straight in the cave before they go anywhere else. Um, but if you keep dying and you keep exploring and keep trying to be a rebel and do other stuff, you get the sense that you're not powerful and you're worried and all these guys are scaring you. And so you come back here. Now, if you get the sword first, that's fine. But if you don't... Um, you've been feeling very weak, and now when you get the sword, you're going to start feeling very powerful. So let's take a look at this opening menu up here. Uh, we got life, heart, 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 very simple. What's in this B and A box? Well, until now, it was blank, but now there's a sword here. Okay, when we get items, they fill the slot. That's one. There's a B here. There must be more items. That's cool. What's this? Some sort of blocky thing. I mean, we all know what it is because we played Zelda. But um, at playing for the first time, you wouldn't know what that is. But it says time zero. Okay, I've got zero of this thing. That's a key. I've got zero keys. And that's a blue ball, maybe magic or something. I've got zero blue balls. All right, this tells us that there are things we can get. We can get a lot of them. Uh, we don't have them right now. So a lot of games often keep your interface very blank. They keep your interface very blank at first because they don't want to overwhelm you with information that's not important. Good idea. But with Zelda, they're not overloading you with anything. They're not giving you any information. There's no tutorial at all. So what this does is they have a big complexity budget. That's what we're talking about. They have a very large complexity budget that they can afford. They can afford to throw some unusual and confusing things at you because they're letting you discover everything on your own. They're not weighing you down with any tutorial whatsoever. So by putting these things here, you're like, huh, I, there's things I can get. I wonder how I get them. And then when you start getting them, you feel, oh, that's cool. 
And that's something Untitled Story did as well. You started getting uh, loot drops, which was money, and you're like, hey, people always say when they do that, hey, there's money in this game. What can I spend that on? And then you start looking for things to spend it on. And that's really cool. And so when you find a shop, you're like, oh, that feels awesome. That's the fulfillment to something I was wondering about. So let's go exploring. Okay, we got these guys again. Now there's only four of them. This is a much easier fight, much more space to move around in. All this is so good. Okay, but let's try out this new sword. Okay, that's cool. Look at this. It goes across the entire screen, and then it explodes, and it's flashing. Look at that. It doesn't even make sense as a sword. <laughs> All right. So that Wait. Where'd it go? Well, this is the thing. If you take any damage, you do not get your powered-up super cool sword anymore, and you got to fight them more honestly, like a real sword. So why do they do that? That's really weird, right? It's really weird that you have this magical super sword that can fire across the room, and that... I seem to don't seem to need it. I can use my sword like this, and that makes sense. So why am I using this magical super sword? Well, look at these hearts. Right now, if you take a hit, you take um, half a life of damage. You take half a life of damage. So what that means is I'm not really that much danger, but I could take six hits and I would die. I will eventually die while exploring in the early game, especially while trying to get the hang of the, hang of the controls. Um, but later on, I'm going to be traversing these exact same sections of the overworld, the exact same places, and the exact same ways, and it's going to be uh, kind of boring, because I know how to beat the, all these guys, and I'm going to have a million of these hearts, as we know how Zelda games work. You just keep getting more and more hearts and a bigger, bigger life meter. So I'm not going to, so I can just walk through these areas and not care as long as I get to my destination. I'll take a few extra damage, but who cares? Well, I do care, because if I take any damage, the first time I take damage, I still care. Because at full health, at full health, I have a super powerful extra ability. So no matter how powerful I get, I always care about how much damage I take, which is really important in an open world area to not make um, later sections feel dumb. So after I take the first hit, though, doesn't it stop being interesting? Doesn't it stop being interesting after I've taken the first hit? Well, no, because even though we're not seeing it now, even though we're not seeing it now, enemies drop stuff. Hey, look, heart piece. And Rupee. Wow, I'm just getting destroyed. This game's actually really hard. <laughs> um, I'm just getting destroyed while I'm just goofing around and showing you off stuff. Showing off stuff. Look, the enemies don't respond, which is really cool. Um, they kind of give you. Sometimes they seem to respond, sometimes they don't. But these, this area seems a little cleared out right now, which is nice. All right. Um, so the thing is, oftentimes enemies will drop hearts, and I was actually one reason I wasn't paying attention too much was I was really surprised that they weren't dropping hearts. Um, we got our first rupee, so like, oh, enemies drop stuff. I can get stuff by killing enemies. And that encourages you to go around and kill enemies. They don't just feel like an obstacle anymore. They feel like something you're kind of empowered to kill. Now, um, these heart meter over here, If I, let's say I'm, I have a thousand hearts, okay? And I want my full power of my sword. Now, if I take one damage, that's bad because I don't have, I'm not full hearts anymore. But if I take three damage, that's still bad because it'll take me longer to get the hearts I need to refill the full just by killing random enemies and unit drops. So basically, because of this meter uh, being at full health, I have a big power. The more damage I take, even if I'm still really far away from dying, the longer it's going to take for me to get back to full health to get my power. If I just take one hit, I can probably get back to power really quickly, get back to full power really quickly, just by getting the next enemy to drop a heart. But if I take more hits, even though I got a heart there, you saw, I took a lot more hits, so I'm actually still not at full power. I'm actually lower than when I started. So... That clever piece of design of at full health, you have this extra superpower, is really good. Now also, it does another thing. It actually does another thing, which is that it keeps the encounters more interesting and more fresh. Let's go around and explore a little bit more. And you see this encounter, look, they're all the way over there. If I had my super sword right now, my throwing magic sword, I could be dealing with these guys really easily. This would be a super easy encounter. Because I don't, it's different. And because you see these areas again and again as you're traversing these er this uh, section, you want these encounters to have a bit of variety. In fact, they actually do something really stupid where they add a stopwatch, like power-up, that just randomly drops, and if you get it, it freezes them. It's like an arcade game-style thing. I can see how it got its way in, but it's not a good piece of design. All right, so it just doesn't feel right in an exploratory open world that randomly there are stopwatch power-ups that drop. <laughs> um, it makes more sense in a, like, a clearly gamified thing like Castlevania. All right, so... Um, basically, I'm looking for hearts now. I'm trying to kill enemies to get hearts, which is good. Heroes want to kill enemies. This is something that Diablo did um, in Diablo 3. They were trying to change their health system because they didn't like the way potions worked. So they started trying to say, okay, we'll have a regenerating health system so that players don't have to spam a million potions. 
Um, the problem is, if you have a regenerating health system, you want to spend all your time running away from enemies that are when you're about to die and slowly healing up. That feels cowardly and dumb. Um, it works in a cover-based shooter. Oh god, look at all these new enemies, and those are blue! And look, they're shooting arrows! Oh my god, I'm so dead! Okay, moving back. <laughs> um, so yeah, they can overwhelm... These screens feel different, and they use lots of enemies really fast. So, just, so we're just going around exploring, checking out stuff. This is how you play the opening game. Now, um, what I was talking about was what they ended up doing was tying it into enemy kills, so that when you, the more closer you got to death, you wanted to kill enemies even more. Because you want you start want to kill enemies even more. Oh, and I'm dead. <laughs> All right, start back from the beginning. But it's it empowers you as a hero. You courageously try to tear through enemies even more, trying to avoid a little bit of damage, but you have to still keep taking them out to get a health power up. That's what Zelda's been doing forever. It's a design that's worked all the way from the beginning, and it works very, very well. Um, so yeah, now I've got my superpower again, and so after, every time I die, here's another thing: my health go back to my health goes back to full right now. Later, when you get more hearts, I don't believe it goes back to full. I forget. I think it only like refills the first ones, um, which is kind of a pain. But you can get to a fairy fountain and it refills to full. But right now, at the beginning, whenever I die, which is when I feel weakest, and I've spent my time without my sword, I come back with my full sword, so I can approach these sections really easily again. Now, final thing on the combat system, and then we'll delve into the rest of the level design. Um, I have a cool shield, right? What is the shield doing in combat? Well, it doesn't do everything against a lot of enemies, but here, it deals with these guys in an interesting way, in that it matters which direction I'm facing. Wow, I've already taken damage. So basically, it matters what direction I'm facing. If these enemies attack me from behind, I am vulnerable. Ahead, as long as I'm not in the middle of a sword swing, I'm immune to, to these enemies. Not all enemies, but these enemies. Um, it's kind of a little inconsistent, which is not good, but the point is, against those early enemies, it matters the direction you're facing, which makes sense. You want players to think about which direction they're facing. I mean, often it doesn't matter in these top-down games. Just turn around and hit a guy, turn around and hit a guy. It doesn't really matter. Just go closer to an enemy, and you dodge it, and you hit him. But here it does. Here it does. I'm caring about positioning, and because in, this, in a big fight like this, it actually does a really good job of mimicking what it feels like, or you imagine it would feel like, to be a hero in one of these adventures. In terms of combat, because you're thinking about guys in every direction. You're thinking about this guy ahead of me, and okay, now I've got to move back, and I've got to be situationally aware. There's going to be guys everywhere. Ooh, great, health power up, and now I can hit all these guys. That's a um, just a fairy again, fairy in a bottle type thing. All right, so basically you want to be very situationally rare, and you don't see it much with these enemies in particular. But watch, look, I'm just exploring. I'm getting rewarded for it. This is something that's really great. Even though I've died, my rupee count keeps going up. This is like something that the new roguelikes do, the really popular ones. The, um, people have t really love the roguelike formula of trying to of playing in adventures over and over again with random elements, and every time it's different, eventually you die. But it gets it's really frustrating to keep losing progress, and the more you master the game, the longer it is to um, do a playthrough because you're lasting longer and longer. And it's frustrating to lose bigger and bigger chunks of progress. Ten minutes, okay, people will start again. In three hours, I tend to find that very frustrating, which is why I don't like much many classic roguelikes. The new ones, like Rogue Legacy, I'm a huge fan of, because they give you progress between deaths. That you can go explore farther and farther and farther and get bigger and better treasures and bigger rewards, and if you die really soon, okay, whatever, you wasted ten minutes. If you die after three hours, you have incredible rewards, and you come back bigger next time. I play the heck out of those new versions of those games. All right. So what do we got here? We got these enemies. I gotta start paying attention. But again, like that's the situational awareness I'm talking about. You need to be aware that these enemies behind you can start messing with you. And by the way, these are just they're putting the same enemies in the same places, but it always feels a little different because the scenery is a little different, the terrain's a little different, it feels a little different. This is how they start adding that variety and content I was mentioning to the open world experience. We're going here, okay, buy something, will ya? This is interesting. This is interesting. So right now we see this flashing diamond thing. We've seen that before. We've seen it drop on enemies. We see we have it here, and we have prices. Buy something, will ya? This tells us it's a shop. This tells us that this is currency. Can we go buy this? No, we cannot buy any of these things, because again, 14 rupees, 60. All right, so I've even, I'm just going to keep exploring and get more and more money, and eventually I will come back and buy these things. But as I'm exploring, it would just be dumb to just grind and get a bunch of stuff. So let's hope, let's hope that we find something interesting. All right, this is a good example of situational awareness, because I cannot bounce back that big flashing bubble. It's clearly different visually from the um, stuff these guys shoot, which is really important, because it'd be really dumb if it wasn't. But it can also, if you hit, get hit by that first, before you get hit, before you start trying to block these guys, it can send you some bad signals. I really feel like they should have 
Uh, just kept the projectiles consistent that you can bounce them back with your shield until later in the game, maybe, and make that more special. Otherwise, it's very confusing about how these early enemies work. All right. So going up here, going around here. All this is good. Okay, let's go to the top. As you can see, we're just exploring big sections of the map. Um, we're at very low life and we're moving along. And so um, this section looks boring. Why is this section so boring? That's a waste of time. There's actually a secret here. Of course there's a secret here. This game is full of insane numbers of secrets. There are entire secret dungeons, effectively. All right, so that was the first area you see that I walked on the map and I was punished for it, like really punished very hard for it. Now those guys really start messing with you. Um, the further you go away from the initial areas, the less leeway you have in the opening rooms. They will be more and more merciless and more and more problematic that if you don't... But the thing is, if you know that those enemies on, are on those screens, you don't know where they are. They appear somewhat at random. But those enemies are these sort of sand burrowing things. And if you know they're in that screen, if you know their territory, which you find via exploration, you know to watch out for them. And you know to be a little bit slower and wait for them to show up before you charge forward. All right. Now, I know this overworld map a little bit, so I'm going to run around and get to where I want to go. So you go exploring, you, you, go, you keep going around. The world feels open and endless, doesn't it? Like, there's stuff in every direction. We have not found a dead end yet. So we keep going and keep exploring, and we keep getting more stuff. And hey, what's this? The color just changed. That feels like we're in a new area. And look, there's a blue thing. That, this, feels, this feels different. All right, so I'm going to go around. And this is actually like the same place we were just at. I'm just going to go down a little bit, even though it's going to risk dying to show it. This is where we died. So I found a, so I know a shortcut. All these areas are interconnected and you're rewarded for map knowledge. We were sort of brought around the long way through this natural extension, but going the sort of unnatural way, we've managed to get to this section. What is this? This feels different. This feels special. There's a big box in new things and there's some sort of major tree ringed by other trees and that looks a lot like a cave. A little awkward, a little ominous, like a monster mouth. People often miss this at first because we're not, we don't haven't been shown that caves have this sort of roof at the top. They, we've been shown that there's sort of a straight block. I think that's sort of a mistake and they shouldn't have done that. They should have been more consistent, but let's go in.